Mount Fuji is a symbol of Japan. And it is actually a volcano formed over hundreds of thousands of years. In the past, smoke often rose from the crater. Japan is one of the world's most volcanically active countries with more than 100 volcanoes. Since ancient times, volcanoes have caused terrible damage. Many Japanese islands were formed volcanically. Sometimes an entire island will be evacuated when an eruption occurs. These are homes that were bombarded with volcanic ash and rocks. But when residents are allowed to return to the island, they try hard to restore a familiar routine. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at volcanoes and examine how the Japanese cope with them. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Our theme for today is volcanoes. I'm standing at the foot of Mount Asama, one of Japan's best known volcanoes. The mountains over there, it's about 2,500 meters or so high. You'll kind of have to take my word for it because you can't really see very much of it today. There was a massive eruption of Mount Asama in 1783 which caused catastrophic damage to the surrounding villages. It was depicted in paintings of the time. All this lava you see around me is what flowed during that eruption and then subsequently hardened. Back in those days, people believed that ogres pushed the lava out of the crater and far be it from me to contradict them. The name they gave to this formation here was Ogre's Pushout. It almost feels like you've alighted on a, a different planet or something. Mount Asama still has regular small eruptions, the latest of which happened in 2009 and caused volcanic ash to fall on parts of Tokyo, which is a good 150 kilometers away. Anyway, let's start off with a look at several volcanoes, including Japan's best-loved mountain, Mount Fuji. Four tectonic plates collide beneath Japan, giving rise to many volcanoes. Scattered across the Japanese archipelago are 108 active volcanoes, 7% of the world total. The highest of these is Mount Fuji. The beautiful silhouette of Mount Fuji with its perfect cone is the product of volcanic activity. It last erupted at the start of the 18th century. It was a huge explosion. The ash cloud turned day to night in what is now Tokyo, 100 kilometers away, and left a thick blanket of ash on the ground. Mount Fuji's crater is about three kilometers around and 237 meters deep. This massive crater was formed by repeated eruptions over a period of hundreds of thousands of years. In the second half of the 18th century, the mountain's volcanic activity subsided and it became a popular pilgrimage site. The mountain's magnificence made it an object of religious veneration. Pilgrims formed groups to climb Mount Fuji. You can still see pilgrims filing up the mountain to this day. Dressed in white, they're on their way to the Shinto shrine at the peak. From the fifth station, people make the five or six hour ascent to see the crater, the source of Mount Fuji's magic. Sengen Jinja is a Shinto shrine that stands on the rim of the crater. Mount Fuji itself is the deity worshipped at the shrine. People face the crater and bow respectfully. During the summer, large crowds set off for the peak while it's still dark. They're aiming to see the sunrise from the summit. 
the ultimate highlight of a Mount Fuji climb. The rising sun viewed from the vantage point of Japan's highest peak holds special meaning. In the presence of such overwhelming natural beauty, people feel both awe and respect. The most costly Japanese volcanic eruption in terms of human lives lost was the 1792 eruption of Mount Unzen Fugeng in southwest Japan. The volcano set off an earthquake that sent a massive landslide plunging down neighboring Mount Mayuyama. It buried the town of Shimabara and swept into the sea. A resulting tsunami hit the town of Omaksa. Between them, the landslide and tsunami killed 15,000 people. Two hundred years later, in 1990, another big eruption began at Mount Unzen Fuge. This lava dome appeared at the peak of the mountain. A mass of magma rises from below and then cools. But it continues to be pushed by magma from beneath, and so the dome grows. Although the surface is cool, inside is extremely hot and full of poisonous volcanic gas. Residents of the area began evacuating, fearing for their lives. Eventually, the lava dome collapsed and tumbled down from the peak. This caused a huge pyroclastic flow, a boiling cloud of hot ash, lava and volcanic gases that billowed down the mountain. In moments, forests, fields and houses were engulfed, flattened and incinerated. More than 40 people who were still in the area were killed. But there was more to come. Huge deposits of ash and earth became saturated by torrential rain and then slipped down the slope. Mudslides swept away even massive boulders and bridges. These pyroclastic flows and mudslides inflicted terrible destruction on the communities at the foot of the mountain. Now let's look at one of Japan's most active volcanoes, Mount Usu in Hokkaido. It has had four major eruptions in the last century alone. It erupted most recently in 2000, from multiple vents behind a hot spring resort frequented by tourists. Because evacuations were carried out well in advance, there were no deaths. However, land upheaval was widespread and huge quantities of rocks and ash rained down on homes. Buildings were completely destroyed. This kindergarten near the crater still has several big volcanic rocks embedded in it. Four months later, the evacuation order was lifted and reconstruction work began. The spa hotels reopened and tourists gradually returned. Volcanic activity is a menace, but in some ways it is also a blessing. It produces beautiful landscape features and other welcome benefits, such as hot springs. A Buddhist temple called Kambara Kannondo once stood here at the foot of Mount Asama. There's 15 steps there behind me going up to a small worship hall. 
Originally there were 50 steps and the hall sat on a rise, but in the eruption of 1783 there was an avalanche of rocks and mud that came down and buried the surrounding villages and most of the steps. If you look down here under the little bridge, you can see that the steps continue down, although after a few meters it's all hidden, buried. When excavation work was done here, the remains were found of two women. A younger woman had been carrying an older woman on her back, but as soon as they'd started going up towards the temple, they'd have been engulfed by the rocks. Later on, we'll go up to the worship hall there, but first of all, here's the story of a man who witnessed the birth of a volcano about 70 years ago. One man dedicated his life to a particular volcano. Masao Mimatsu was born in 1888. Mimatsu painted this picture of Showa Shinzang, literally New Mountain of the Showa Era. How many paintings have you done? Mm, uh, 1,000, maybe 2,000? What do you like most about the mountain? I like uh, that the appearance of the mountain keeps changing. At uh, one point it looks rugged and uh, some other time beautiful. It never looks the same. Mount Usu rises beside Lake Toya in Hokkaido. Showa Shinzan stands to the east of it. It's a small volcano around 400 meters high. In fact, the spot where Showa Shinzan now stands was once level ground cultivated with wheat. But towards the end of 1943, frequent earthquakes began occurring and finally the ground began to heave up. At times the surface rose 30 centimeters per day. In just two years, a mountain had formed. When the eruption began, the Second World War was raging. It was a time of great tension in Japan and the authorities decided not to monitor or report on the eruption. Mimatsu was then 55 years old and the local postal chief. In his youth, he had been an assistant to a volcanologist. He had been taught that anyone who is present at an eruption should make detailed observations for the sake of future disaster reduction. So Mimatsu made it his business to chronicle in detail the emergence of this new volcano. Here are Mimatsu's sketches of the volcano's emergence. The flat field of wheat buckles and finally erupts. Magma bursts out of the top and a lava dome rises. Everything is depicted with great attention to detail. Mimatsu did this illustration to show all the changes in the volcano's contour over time. It was later presented at an international volcano conference as the Mimatsu diagram and was praised by professional volcanologists. Having witnessed the volcano's birth, Mimatsu took an almost paternal interest in it. In 1946, he invested his entire fortune to purchase the land it stood on from the farmers who owned it. Thanks to Mimatsu's tireless efforts, in 1957 the volcano was designated as a special natural monument of Japan, and it now attracts many sightseers. Even after his death, people continue to recall Mimatsu's determination to acknowledge the power of nature and to learn from it. Mimatsu must have loved that volcano because he spent a fortune buying up the mountain Shōwa Shinzan, 
partly to protect the environment, but also to provide some relief for the farmers who'd lost their fields. And today his grandchildren continue to maintain the property of the same loving care. All right, let's move up to the worship hall now. As you can see, there's just these 15 steps. It's hard to imagine that there were originally 50. Of the 570 villagers who lived here at the time of the eruption, only 93 survived. And those are the ones who had already fled up here to the temple or happened to be outside the village at the time. The survivors rebuilt the village on the same spot and ever since then their descendants have carefully maintained this temple. And sitting with me now is one of the descendants of the survivors, Mr. Miyazaki. Miyazaki-san, can you tell us something about how the 93 survivors rebuilt their community here? The survivors were like one big family. So, a man who lost his wife was paired up with a woman who lost her husband. Children who lost their parents started to live with parents who lost their children. Like that, new families were formed. And these people recreated their community right where the old one was buried. It's a real testament to the willpower of people to rebuild their lives, I suppose. Next, we're going to take a look at the residents of an island and their efforts to recover after the devastation wreaked by a volcano. Out in the Pacific Ocean, six hours by ferry from central Tokyo, is Miyake Island, which is volcanic. Mount Oyama, the volcano, towers at the center of the island. It erupts every 20 years or so. In the year 2000, a big eruption took place, and all 3,900 people on the island were evacuated. The evacuation order was lifted in 2005, four years and five months after everyone had been forced to leave. The returning residents were met by the sight of ruined homes. More than five years have passed since then, but certain areas are still uninhabitable because volcanic gas lingers. Some former residents still want to return, but cannot do so. Now the population of Miyake Island is only 70% of what it was before the eruption and tourism is down to only half of what it used to be. One woman has made great efforts to rejuvenate the island. Natsu Anahara was born and raised on Miyake Island. At the age of 15, she had to leave the island because of the eruption. Now, 10 years later, she has returned. In the old days, she would invite friends to the island and have them experience the local fishing and farming. She recalled how much her friends enjoyed doing that. That gave her the idea of offering experience tours, featuring the island's fishing and farming. She hoped it would boost tourism and lift the spirits of the islanders. I first realized how much I loved this island after I had to... ...making preparations in her time off. Here she approaches a fisherman, Toshifumi Takeda, who harvests seaweed used in the island's famous agar. She asks if he would be willing to help her out, but his reaction is not encouraging. I'd bring a group around, so would you chat with them? No, I'd rather not. Following the eruption, Takeda's harvest plummeted. He feels life is just too hard to help out with the tours. Undeterred, Anahara goes across the sea to the mainland to promote the tours. Her former kendo instructor, Kazuyuki Akagi, ran a hotel on Miyake Island before the eruption. Now he runs a restaurant in central Tokyo. 
Anahara gives him some flyers to put in the restaurant. Lucky you. I hope you'll come back soon too. No, I'd love to, but uh, you know. Akagi had to borrow money to open the restaurant. Things are too tight for him to consider going back to Miyake Island. Many other former residents are in the same boat. For economic reasons, they gave up on the idea of returning. In the summer, a group of university students books an island experience tour. Anahara takes them to local workshops and fields, the source of the island's best-known products. Tasks that are second nature to the islanders are entirely new to the tour participants. Next they go to a place where the seaweed is dried. Although Takeda was initially skeptical about the tour, Anahara's enthusiasm won him over and he agreed to show the visitors what he does. Processing the seaweed involves more than just sun drying it. The dried material is washed by trampling on it a number of times. These tour participants are trying it for the first time and they find it very enjoyable. This makes Takeda happy. They say it's fun. <laughs> Finally, Anahara shows them a lake that was formed when water filled a crater which was left by an eruption 2,000 years ago. Since then, it has become surrounded by lush greenery. I brought everyone here to this lush forest as our final stop so that you can go home with this image of an island that is really coming back to life. Your visit is helping to revitalize our island, so please visit the island again. Anahara hopes that the people of Miyake Island will once again be brimming with life just as vegetation on the volcano has regenerated. The volcano will always be there. The islanders are working hard to restore the vitality of island life. Take a look at these fields at the foot of Mount Asama. You'll see the highland cabbages for which this area is famous. It's almost like a sea of green. The black soil that you'll see underneath the cabbages is produced by the weathering of ancient volcanic ash, which over time mixes with organic material. It's found in many parts of Japan. It drains efficiently and crops grow well in it. When volcanic ash falls on crops, the immediate effect is of course disastrous. And it takes quite a long time for any of the benefits to become apparent. Next though, we're going to take a look at some of the positive aspects of Japan's volcanic activity. Hot springs occur where groundwater heated by volcanic activity bubbles up from the earth. Japan has lots of hot springs, and people love soaking in them. The heat of rocks deep underground can also be harnessed to generate clean energy. This is the Yanaizu Nishiyama Geothermal Power Plant in Fukushima Prefecture. With a maximum output of 65,000 kilowatts, it can serve up to 100,000 households. Geothermal heat can be used as a source of heat in greenhouses as well. A hot spring is channeled into this plastic greenhouse situated at the foot of Mount Usu in Hokkaido, making the cultivation of tomatoes possible in the winter. Sakurajima in Kagoshima Prefecture is an active volcano. The city of Kagoshima, with a population of 600,000 people, is only five kilometers away. The volcano erupts almost daily, and ash falls on the city. Around Kagoshima Prefecture, there is a vast amount of soil formed from ancient deposits of volcanic ash. The soil is called Shirasu. Because it's highly acidic, it's not suited to agriculture, but researchers have found other uses for it. Mm. 
The researchers at the Kagoshima Prefectural Institute of Industrial Technology focused on the water-retaining capability of shirasu and mixed it with concrete to develop shirasu blocks. Grass planted on these blocks requires less watering and care and the lightness of the material makes these blocks a good choice to provide more greenery in everyday life. Shirasu is also used in food processing. Underneath this Shirasu is filleted Pacific Sori. This product is called Ash Dried Sori. Each grain of Shirasu has lots of tiny pores so it readily absorbs moisture. Compared to sun-dried or machine-dried sori, the ash-dried variety offers more umami savouriness and freshness of flavour. Shirasu has also been harnessed to create a high-tech material. It's called SPG, Shirasu Porous Glass, which is made by melting shirasu. SPG contains countless tiny and evenly-sized pores, it can be used to improve the performance of semiconductor chips. SPG is expected to contribute to more compact and higher performance electronic components. Volcanoes wreak havoc, but they have also brought Japan great benefits. From food processing to high-tech industries, the quest to harness the power of volcanoes continues in a broad range of fields. Japan has more than its fair share of natural disasters, including earthquakes and volcanoes. Both of these can have terrible consequences, but people who live in the vicinity of volcanoes seem to take a kind of pride in them, returning to live in their shadow once the volcano has become quiet again. Of course, there are hot springs and other benefits, as we've seen in the long term, but it may be the awesome power of the volcanoes themselves that acts as a magnet on people. I'll see you again next time. Next time our theme is Udon noodles, of which there are many regional varieties. We'll explore why they are so popular. <laughs>